this is, is really a first for the Vermont Land Trust. Uh, an amazing first, a gathering uh, of all of us online for our very first virtual annual meeting. Um, we know about Zoom fatigue. I mean, we've all probably been over Zoomed. So we will keep this to an hour. Um, it, it's very different than being in person together for half a day on conserved land somewhere in the state, but we vow that we'll bring as much energy and intention to this event as we do every year. So um, what I'd like to see, let's find out a little bit who is with us. If you look on the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, something called chat. And open your chat, uh, your chat window will appear to the right of your screen. And uh, just tell us where you're joining from. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to have a sense of that. Heinsberg, Montreal, Braintree, Waterbury. Oh man, it's coming in so fast, I can't read. We're live, okay. Um, South Hero, Duxbury, Thetford, Danby, Heinsberg. Uh, Massachusetts, Quebec, Richmond, Braintree, Bennington, Waterbury, Plattsburgh, Middlebury, Shelburne, Westford, Vermont, North Bennington, down Bennington's well represented, Wallingsford, Wallingsford, Montpelier, Mount Holly, Bur finally, Burlington, uh, Hanover, Northfield, Ontario, uh, Stowe, Marshfield, uh, Charlotte, Sterling College, Mount Holly, Arizona. All right, somebody's traveling and hunkering in place. Middlesex, Essex, Chester, Underhill, Montgomery, Greenfield, Heartland, Franklin, oh, Massachusetts, someone from Maine, uh, Woodstock, Waitsfield, and on Concord, New Hampshire, goodness. South Burlington, Colchester, Dummerston. So, from a VLT conserved organic farm in Whitingham, Richmond, Medford, ah, someone who's quarantining or whatever, trying to breathe in Los Angeles, California, New Fane, Etc. Cornwall, Brooklyn, New York. So anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for letting uh, letting us know. Um, I have the pleasure of working with a wonderful CEO of the Vermont Land Trust. So I want to turn this over to Nick Richardson for the briefly for the next section of the meeting. Nick, great. Thanks, Mark, and I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, and Caitlin, I'm also going to ask you just to. Uh, unmute my good friend Rich Holshu, who's also joined us as a panelist. So it's great, great to be with you all. Um, and Rich is waving and saying hello. Um, I'll be back in a few minutes, but the first thing that we wanted to do to start off this meeting um, was to provide this annual celebration. We're going to do an acknowledgement. And I feel really grateful to have Rich, who's my friend and colleague here, to accept this offering from us. Um, so again, hi, Rich. Great to see you. Uh, this land we call Vermont has been home to the Abenaki people and the Mohican people and their ancestors and allies since time immemorial. And these lands are their lands. These lands were not empty when our European ancestors arrived here and their settlements and villages displaced, disrupted, and ultimately destroyed the settlements and villages of indigenous people that were here before. The Abenaki and other indigenous people have continued to live in this land and be part of our communities, oftentimes without revealing their identity or their culture out of fear. If we're gonna make progress in building deep, healing relationships between all people and this land we love, 
we need to acknowledge this history and the way it shapes us today. And we need to commit to the long, hard work ahead to address its impacts. Rich. Uliuni Nick Kwai Uski Nidombak, Bakwinom Guzian, Wigodam Namiolan, and Dele Wizi, Lit Sandai Wantastagak Tali Sokwakik. Hello, my friend, it's good to see you today. Uh, my name is Rich. I live down the river in what we call Brattleboro today, but is traditionally known as Wantastagak. Every place in this state has been known by people for thousands and thousands of years. We're all here now. A lot has happened to bring us to this point. And I think the question we're faced with is, what do we do now? I look at the name of this presentation, this uh, annual meeting today, The Ground We Share, Access, Equity, and Justice on the Land. This underscores what Nick just voiced. And I appreciate that you're all here to uh, share in this exploration to begin thinking about this, add it into how we go forward from here. And uh, I would like to welcome you, just for myself, to Indakina, our homelands, the Abenaki people. Enjoy the meeting, and I'm glad to see that Susana will be speaking today. I look forward to that. Uliuni, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thanks so much for being with us. Mark, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you. So uh, I've been looking at more attendees. We have a couple of folks from our, our partner and funder, VHCB. We have a representative of Senator Sanders' office here. We have someone, not just someone, but the head of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. So we're getting more and more people. And thank you so much for joining us. So here's what we're going to cover today in one short hour. Um, I'm going to talk just a little longer, and then uh, Nick is going to going to talk to you, and then we'll have a keynote address from Susanna and awards. Um, so, um, to our members, thank you. Many of you have been with us for years, and your support means a tremendous amount. I mean, it's it's the basis of our existence. And many of you are brand new members, and some of you probably aren't members, and I, I hope you'll join. There are serious benefits to being a member. You can see them on the slide, um, including something new this year, actually. Last year, we talked to you about our work in northern Vermont to, firm, to form the first forest uh, carbon cooperative. Um, the, those carbon credits will soon be available exclusively to purchase, exclusively to members. So more information on that to come. 2020 has been a year like no other. Here's our year in little photos, which you can peruse briefly, covering a range of issues we've addressed a pandemic response and recovery for farmers, connecting people to the outdoors teams, um, a launch of the Farmland Futures Fund, and continuing to conserve land. And, and just here are a few highlights. We've conserved over 7,300 acres, including 22 farms and 4,600 acres of forest land. 238 acres of valuable wetlands and 3,300 acres for public access. Uh, conservation is core to what we do, but it doesn't stop there. Our annual report coming to you next month will feature many of the stories and ways we're deepening our impact way beyond conservation. Con conservation is a wonderful tool and it's allowing us to accomplish many other things. Um, my job as board chair is easy, um, even though um, 
it can be a lot of work, but I get the pleasure of leading our fantastic board who bring a range of expertise and knowledge to our organization. As you can see in the slide that you're looking at, um, we have four new board members voted in by you, our members, in advance of this meeting. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to go over the new members of the board. They're wonderful people. They'll really add to the power and variety and experience in our board. You can see more about them and our full board. I urge you to take a look at vlt.org slash trustees and you'll you'll see their biographies. So, Nick, I now turn the meeting back over to you. Eric, thanks so much, Mark. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you all. Again, I'm Nick Richardson. I'm the president and CEO of the Vermont Land Trust. It's a really beautiful day out there. Um, so I hope everybody's gotten a chance to be out in it. Maybe you'll even take this meeting outside with you. And if not, you're at least having the opportunity to enjoy, if you're here in Vermont, a view of this beautiful place um, outside of a window. As, as Mark said, this annual celebration is very different from what we've done in the past in a number of ways. We're, we're zooming in from our homes and screens and offices, um, you know, as opposed to being together in person like we, we like to do um, and gather for the day on a, a piece of conserved land. On the bright side, we have 200 uh, participants zooming in. I'm assuming that there are at least a few couples who are in that mix and it's by far the largest annual meeting that Vermont Land Trust has ever had. Um, and many of you are joining us for the first time, um, which is really exciting. I want to say a particular welcome to you. Uh, so, but that's not the only difference. Um, you know, VLT is also growing and evolving as an organization in response to this question that we've been asking, uh, which is what does Vermont need from us today? And that question is leading us into new areas of work and new partnerships including some of the work that we're doing at Pine Island Community Farm in Colchester. Um, and Someh Mohammed, uh, the gentleman pictured here, and his three children, Hassan, Zainab, and Hobibu, are examples of some of the folks that we're getting to work with at Pine Island in the New American community that I'll talk more about later in my presentation. It's really exciting. And um, we know that this new and broader vision for VLT is so essential, you know, a vibrant future for Vermont's working landscapes and our rural communities requires this of us today. So instead of spending a, a lot of time listing off project successes um, and other accomplishments, and there have been many of those this year, I, I promise, um, we're going to spend our time today instead focusing on one particular issue, which is justice and equity on the land. You might be asking why a land conservation organization is taking time to talk about justice and equity. And our answer, which we shared in my message to you in June, to our members in June, um, how will we reckon with injustice, is that along with so much of what we love about Vermont, its beauty, its lands, its people and communities, VLT also inherits a troubling legacy of exclusion, and inequality that is woven into the fabric of Vermont. It's something we cannot ignore. And I believe that our love for this place, which I know we all share, gives us the strength that we need to confront that legacy if we choose to. When I sent that message out in June asking how we'll reckon in, with injustice, some of you wondered why I was asking this question and some of you let me know pretty directly that you were wondering. <laughs> and I can understand that. You know, VLT has been effective as an organization in part because of the way we focus on working lands, farm and forest viability, access to open space and ecological protection. And yet those of you who've been with us for many years or know our founding story will, rec will recall that the roots of this organization spring from a community's fervent wish to be more inclusive, to be more equitable, 
and to improve the prospects for many, not just the few. It's true. And today, as our society is in the midst of a drastic and painful coming to terms with the deep scars of injustice, with wealth inequality, and with racism that's on display every day, VLT has a responsibility in this moment. But it's more than that. We also have a great opportunity to respond anew and with fresh energy to the call that brought us into being over 40 years ago. And for some of you, our connection to justice and equity is clear and resonant. You may be familiar with Vermont's history of bigotry, much of which is tied to land access and ownership. From the first land speculators who laid claim to the lands of the Abenaki people, to campaigns in the early 20th century that recruited white people of Northern European descent to visit, settle, and farm in Vermont, to the Vermont Eugenics Program, which targeted poor, white, disabled, and Abenaki people. So white landed Vermonters have benefited from systems and structures that have long excluded people unlike them from this land for some time. And by now you may be finding yourself asking, well, what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> um, and you know, one thing I've learned on my own journey in, with these topics is how important it is to accept non-closure. So asking the questions, listening and learning is really part of the work, even if we don't know what comes next. It starts with understanding and acknowledging our history fully, which we are doing as a staff and board in conversation with people inside and outside of the organization. And it continues with relationship building, forming community, which we're doing with all of you, plus others who've been distant from us in the past, such as the Abenaki people, people of color, and people without means or, or access to own land. And then comes action. So, you know, the journey is by no means straightforward or linear, but it does create the possibility for some transformational change. And I'm really proud of the steps that we've taken over the last few years in this direction, supporting the development of the Pine Island Community Farm, which offers the opportunity of land access to grow food, to renew a connection to land with so many of our community members from the New American community, resettled refugees in Colchester, Burlington, and Winooski. I'm also really excited about the work that we're doing with leaders from the Abenaki on a variety of land projects, including, as Rich was describing, the reclaiming and renaming of Wantastagok in Brattleboro. These projects are leading to new friendships, a broader view of what's possible, and they're a step toward a future for Vermont and its land that includes all the people who call this place home. And it's with that spirit of learning and community that we've invited Susanna Davis here to speak with us today. So I'd like to welcome Susanna up, I guess, kind of up to the mic here. Um, Susanna, welcome. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction um, and we'll move into your talk. I first met Susanna when we were both working uh, we were asked to participate in the governor's COVID recovery task force this spring, which helped to advise the governor's team on the road to recovery and get services working again across Vermont. Uh, it was challenging, rewarding work, and I just found that it really bought, brought out the best in people. Uh, Susanna serves as the state's, uh, state of Vermont's first executive director of racial equity, where she works with state agencies to identify and address systemic racial disparities and support the state's efforts to expand and diversify Vermont's population. Prior to joining the state of Vermont, she was Director of Health and Housing Strategic Initiatives at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and before that, the Director of the Black Latino Asian Caucus of the New York City Council. She holds a JD with a concentration in international human rights law from New York Law School, where she also directed a civil liberties education program for low-income youth and youth of color. She studied anthropology and philosophy at Fordham University, earning the Reverend J. Franklin Ewing Award for writing on the relationship between global human rights violations and the proliferation of HIV AIDS. Wow. Susanna is a first generation US born Latina and believes in open space, in open access to government for all people 
regardless of their background or place of origin. She's fluent in Spanish, and her name is pronounced like the phrase Susana. So Susana, welcome. We're so happy to have you with us. Yes, yes, it's really, really great to be here. Hello, everyone. So I, all right, all right, all right, I have to confess, I have to confess, I am a big fat liar. Uh, I'm sorry, Nick, this was a massive bait and switch. Uh, I told you I was going to come here today and talk about how land trust and conservation can create equity. And I'm probably not. Um, I'm probably not one because I can't do that in 20 minutes. I have very poor time management skills. And two, because I think to some extent we know the answers. To some extent we know the answers because uh, underrepresented and marginalized communities have been saying them for years. So what I am gonna do today is to show us some of the ways in which land and land use impact people in other parts of their lives to create a web or a network of justice or injustice. And I hope that's okay. Sounds so let's begin. So on our next slide, um, and I'm gonna paint you all sort of visual pictures for those of you who are either um, not on the phones or who may have different learning, or who are on the phones or who may have different learn learning styles. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to say is the land that we call Vermont remains unceded indigenous territory. And this is important. It was not given or sold to anyone by the indigenous people. And so as we think about land use and what we're going to do with land and what we're not going to do with land, let's all keep in mind that this land was never ours to begin with to make those decisions. And this is big, right? I mean, if your grandpa stole my grandpa's bike, and then made a fortune riding that bike everywhere and then passed it down to your dad and passed it down to you and you all kept that wealth from that magical bicycle. And, and you look at me and you say, well, your grandpa should have kept his own bicycle. He should have bought his own. He should have pulled himself up by his bicycle chain bootstraps so that you could have a bike today that was worth half as much as my bike is, right? So in keeping, just keeping in mind that ownership is often dictated by whoever it is who had the gunpowder. And so we are operating within the context of that uh, dictated ownership. So let's move on to our next slide now that we got that out of the way. And by the way, I just, you know, it is very hard to be the one who's gonna depress you right before your awards. So I'm very sorry for that. We're gonna make it, it's gonna be tough. I wanna talk a little bit about Vermont. Who is Vermont? What is Vermont? And I wanna share with you four statistics. The first is that in a National Park Service survey, 16% of African-American respondents said that they don't go to the national parks because they don't feel safe there. And of course, yes, this is specific to national parks, but I think we can extrapolate with any big green spaces. I don't know the difference between a national park, a state park, a town forest. I just, I just you could put me in front of, in, in like the right place in Central Park, and I might think I was in a state Park. So the point is, green spaces where outdoor activities are encouraged. Um, many people of color, particularly African Americans, don't feel like those spaces are for them. Next, I want to share that about one in three of indigenous Vermonters were diagnosed with depression between 2012 and 2016, which is higher than the rate for white Vermonters. Vermonters of color have a home ownership rate of just under 50%, while white Vermonters have a home ownership rate of over 70%. And this matters a lot because as you all already know, land ownership and land wealth often translates to more civic participation, more influence in the way that things are happening at the municipal and state levels, and more, um, shall we say, agency over your surroundings, your physical environment. And last, I want to point out that African Americans in Vermont are more than six times as likely to be arrested for misdemeanor marijuana possession than white Vermonters are, even though white Vermonters use or possess cannabis at the same or higher rates. Now, why do all of these things matter for a, top, for, for a conversation about land and land use? Because when we talk about who doesn't feel comfortable in green spaces and in parks and conserved lands, when we talk about the indigenous people from whom we took these lands, and the high rates of depression and other physical and mental illness that are experienced in the community. 
when we talk about home ownership, land ownership, and that physical wealth. And when we talk about the criminal justice outcomes related to the cultivation, sale, consumption, and possession of a, an actual plant that you can grow on actual land, all of this swirls around to tell us, a, a, to paint us a bigger picture about the ways that land can be manipulated in order to serve certain agendas or exclude others from your agenda. On our next slide, we're gonna start looking a little bit at demographics. What you're looking at is a population pyramid. We use these a lot in demography. And what they do is they tell you the age and sex distribution of a population. So this is the population pyramid for Vermont. You'll see that the bars toward the top are older age groups. They're stratified by age. So at the very, very top there, we've got 85 plus years old. And at the very bottom, we've got a cohort of zero to five. On the left are females, on the right are males. They tend to be balanced pretty easy, but evenly around 50%. But what you see is that we've got a large chunk of our state population that is clustered in that 45 to 75 age range. We've got far fewer in the mid 20s and 30s. And we've got a bit of a bump out between 15 and 24 years old. Now that bump out between 15 and 24 is because Vermont attracts a lot of college age students who come here to learn, but as you can see, they shrink again in population when they graduate because they leave the state. One of the reasons that we'll hear that people leave the state at that age is because housing and home ownership is so difficult to come by. Uh, I'll, I'll share something with you on this recorded call. One of the things that drew me to Vermont, well, sorry, one of the things that drove me to leave New York was the fact that that state is the most high, is the highest tax state in the union income tax. Vermont is number four. But Vermont actually, when it comes to property taxes, is the highest in the nation. So when we talk about home ownership and land ownership for young adults, people for whom education has represented a higher share of their income than in previous generations, and people for whom housing tends to represent a higher share of their income than previous generations, it's really important to keep in mind that that critical cohort of recent grads we're losing them, and housing is one of the reasons why. Now our next slide is gonna show us um, the predicted percent change in population in Vermont. And what we find here is that broken down by racial group, Vermont is set to be much more multicultural, much more ethnically diverse. By 2050, it's estimated that the black Vermonter population is gonna grow by almost 300%. The Latino and Asian Pacific Islander Vermonter populations by almost 200%. The indigenous population by 20%, which is actually quite a feat because what you don't see is that in the chart for the years immediately preceding these years, so in other words, for the years up to 2010, that was actually a negative 13%. So we were losing more indigenous identified people up until 2010. Now it's a gain of 20 estimated. And finally, mixed race Vermonters are set to grow in number by over 200%. Now that is exciting because look at the pretty colors. However, of course, we're talking about 200 and 300% of already low numbers, right? Uh, so let's just say Black Vermonters make up about 2% of the state population. So 300% growth will put them at about 6%, which is cool. Um, but, you know, we're not, we're not turning a huge tide, but it's still progress nonetheless. Now, the next two slides, we can go through these pretty quickly. The first one here is you're seeing the median age ranked by state, and you'll see that Vermont has the second highest median age. And on the following slide, you will see that Vermont has the least, the second least diverse state. We are the second whitest state in the country. Uh, in both cases, we are second to Maine. But our next slide is really what puts this all together because those two data points don't tell us the whole story. When we break down age, uh, median age, and uh, ethnicity by racial group, then what we find is that white Vermonters and indigenous Vermonters do have median ages in the mid and late 40s respectively, but all other Vermonters of color actually have median ages in the 20s. So what that tells us is that it's actually people of color who are keeping Vermont young. And so as we think about the next generation of people who are going to be working the lands, buying the lands, wanting to look at the lands from their backyards with a tin mug of coffee that they bought at a really great antique shop because the state is swimming with antique shops. As we think about who's that next generation of people who are gonna be enrolling their young children in schools and um, 
becoming the new select board members and legislative leaders, this is who our, our state is gonna look like. So, our next slide is gonna show, it's gonna start to tell us a little bit about land. And, and we can go through these pretty quickly. I just wanna talk a little bit about what is land. And land is a lot of things. To start with, land is food justice. We know that a lot of people in the country live in food deserts and food swamps. You've likely heard of food deserts. Those are places where you don't have easy access to fresh, healthy foods. You may not have heard of food swamps. Those are areas where your unhealthy food options outnumber your healthy food options, usually by four to one. Now we know that food deserts and food swamps tend to be located disproportionately in low-income communities and communities of color, and often low-income communities are the communities of color. So it also tracks closely with the presence of certain chronic conditions like diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Keep in mind that conditions like diabetes, obesity, and heart disease are considered underlying factors that make people at higher risk of things like COVID-19. So there are real consequences here. And that's why I, if I had a TV, I would have thrown something at it, watching Jerome Adams, the Surgeon General, get up on stage and say, people of color, we have higher rates of asthma and higher rates of diabetes and this, this, and that, without also acknowledging that so much of that is epigenetic, not genetic. When I was at the health department in New York, we used to say your zip code has a bigger impact on your health than your genetic code. And it's so true. Where we live is everything. So you have a lot of cars and smog and exhaust around you, a lot of street uh, light pollution, or do you have beautiful mountain views and clean air, green grass, etc. Next slide, please. We also know that uh, the presence of food deserts and food swamps, not only does it contribute to those poor health outcomes, but those poor health outcomes also contribute to poor economic outcomes. For example, the cost of undiagnosed, excuse me, the cost of diagnosed diabetes has grown by over 26% in the last five years. It now costs America $327 billion. And that's just the cost of diagnosed diabetes. We all know people who may have uh, undiagnosed and unmanaged diabetes. Additionally, there's a lot of job absenteeism that is resultant from obesity. Obesity-related job absenteeism costs us more than $4 billion a year, and it's driving huge health costs, over $200 billion a year. So effectively, we have wonderful land, and we are, we're trying to figure out what to do with it. And part of what we can do is to grow healthy food in healthy communities by people who can get healthy work experience out of it. And we also have uh, a society of people who are not seeing the gains of that, of that healthy food, and it's hurting all of us economically and socially. So that's land as food justice. I want to talk a bit about land just as possibilities. How do we think about land and what kinds of conversations, social conversations, are we even willing to talk about with respect to land? What you're looking at is two screenshots from two tweets by the same thinker, we'll say, uh, on Twitter, on the left, this person takes very seriously and goes into detail about military strategy in Westeros, which, as many of you know, is the fictional land where Game of Thrones takes place. Game of Thrones is a TV show that is almost entirely white people, and so this is a very serious tweet about a very serious topic in a very fictional place. On the right, you see that same person tweeting in response to a New York Times article the article is about Wakanda, which is the fictional place where Black Panther takes place. And this person simply replies, Wakanda does not exist. Because we're willing to suspend reality to talk about Westeros because we care about it, but we are not willing to talk about the possibilities that an advanced, fictitious nation in Africa could possibly have to tell us as a society when it's Wakanda. Here's some more on the next slide you'll see that land is not just possibility, but it's exclusivity. This is a tweet from July from the president who says he's happy to inform all of the people living their suburban lifestyle dream that they will no longer be bothered or financially hurt by having low income housing built in their neighborhood. That is code for don't worry, we're raising the gates higher to keep out the melanin and the pores. So when we think about exclusivity, 
And this is something that he's speaking very generally about the suburban dwellers and the suburban lifestyle dream, but this hits close to home too. And you'll see that on our next slide, which is a little bit more Vermont specific. We had an eighth grader a few years ago who thought our state could use a new motto and it should be in Latin because all respectable words are said in Latin. And so the young lady proposed it and this was the response that she was met with. Dorothy says, it should say, go back where you came from. Dan says, the motto is on the language of the foreigners trying to take over the country should be Chinese since they are more than the Mexicans. Go back to Kenya, I don't speak atheist. Brenda says, I don't think so. I hate having to press one for English now. And Gary, this is my favorite, Gary says, hell no, this is America, not Latin America. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Now, I don't know who is gonna be the one to tell Gary that the Romans spoke Latin, but that might have more to do with our public education system in this country than it does with Latin or state mottos. So the point with this slide is that when we talk about Vermont and the culture of tolerance and grooviness here, it's not until we're confronted with the possibility of inclusion or what people think is inclusion, Latin, I mean, really. Um, when, we're, when we're confronted with the possibility of inclusion, that's when you see people's real strength. Our next slide is gonna show a little bit more about exclusivity. This is a photo that I took about three months ago. Um, it was on my neighbor's car and uh, the neighbors had, I guess, moved in a couple months prior or something. I don't know, I don't pay attention. Um, and they said, they wrote on the, du the dust in their back windshield, it says, we live in Vermont, waiting on new plates. Now this was on the heels of that incident in Hartford where that black couple who had recently purchased a home in Vermont and had long vacationed here, had been harassed as outsiders because of their license plates. So this is a person who lives next door to me who was so worried about being harassed or berated or having her property vandalized that they had to write in dust that they are Vermonters in some sense or fashion and hope that the rain doesn't wash this notice away so that people don't look at her license plates and retaliate. So when we think about who owns this land, when people from this state smile and politely think to themselves, oh, bless her heart, she thinks she's one of us, but she's not, she's a flatlander. Keeping in mind that this remains unceded indigenous territory. It's not yours either. It doesn't belong to any of us. It's really important when we think about who we're keeping in or out of our lands, who's an outsider, who gets to be an insider, how many generations does it take? So our, our next slide is gonna tell us a little bit about um, the consequences that can come from that feeling of exclusivity. You're looking at two images. One is an image of a person of color and it's captioned by the AP as a person wading through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store. On the bottom, you see a similar image. It's two white people and they are described as wading through chest deep flood water after finding bread and soda, blah, blah, blah. And in case you thought this was a fluke, I can assure you it's not. Here's the next one. We've got another image, two people of color described as looters, carry bags of groceries. Here's the next one. An image of two white people who are described as people salvaging supplies. And when I, when I show these slides, oftentimes people laugh because it's just so ridiculous. But truth be told, it's not a laughing matter because what's the difference between a looter and a finder? A shotgun in your face. And speaking of looters and shotguns, let's take a look at our next slide to talk some more about the consequences of the way that we frame uh, this, this language. So here, uh, you may have seen some of these images. On the left, you see a picture of James Blake who was recently murdered by the government on camera when he was shot seven times in the back while go getting into his car. Protests erupted in his hometown when that happened. During those protests, the young man you see on the right, who is a 17-year-old who lives one state over, decided that it was his duty uh, to pick up a semi-automatic weapon, drive across state lines into the protest zone, and shoot people. 
to defend property, property that he didn't own and that was 20 minutes away in, across state lines. Now, what you'll see is that these two images are from the same publication and they describe the victim, the person who was murdered on camera by the government as having a knife in his car when he was shot by police versus the young man on the right who is shown cleaning up graffiti before shooting. Let's look at the next one for some more consequences. Land is not only possibility and land is not only a point of exclusivity and worth defending, but it's also a barrier. On the left, you see a headline about a woman who was homeless. She had no land. She didn't even have a place to rent. And so she used a friend's address to enroll her son in school. She was given five years in jail for that. On the right, you see an image of a celebrity who is well known, uh, who was just given two months in prison because she forged or falsified academic and athletic records so that her children and paid a lot of money to bribes in bribes so that her children could get into better schools. Now, of course, this is also a commentary on wealth, not just on um, on race. But what's really important is that whether or not a person has land or has an address that they can say, I live here, I rent here, I own here, could be the difference between five years in jail for putting your child in school versus 20 years in the shelter system. Next slide, please. Are you depressed yet? I've got more. I wanna talk a little bit about the origins of radical policy and we're nearing the end uh, of, this, of this talk. I'm probably already over time, sorry. Uh, but you know, I wanna talk about this because oftentimes, well, more so, more so now than perhaps six months ago, you are going to be presented with options on how you can act and how you can move the needle on equity. And it's not just racial equity, right? It's equity for the LGBTQIA plus community, people living with disabilities, socioeconomic equity, um, youth, seniors, everyone, right? Any kind of equity work that you might take part in in your practice, you're gonna hear suggestions on what you can do or what the state or the government can do. And some of those, you might consider them as too far or too radical. Um, and, and I wanna just talk about this one example of radical policy. This was school breakfasts, which at the time when they were first being um, audibly proposed, were really under the radar of nutritionists and um, educational experts. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense said, we're gonna make this a capstone issue. They pursued it and they implemented their own breakfast in schools program. And once people saw the immediate need and the positive results, then suddenly it was on the radar for public health experts and academic uh, and education experts who acknowledged that this was incredible. It was transformative. It improves students' outcomes. It reduces the need for behavior modifications. It reduces students acting out. It boosts test performance and generally improves cognitive and physical and mental and emotional ability. It's a win. Who doesn't like breakfast? I love breakfast. I might eat breakfast right after I'm done here. I don't know. But you know, when we think about the fact that this policy began as a radical thing by a radical group of black people, Let's not forget that today in 2020, you're gonna be confronted with ideas for policy change. And you might think to yourself, well, that's too radical. And you know what? That's what they said about free breakfast in schools. And I say that to you because land is one of the biggest things that we have and hold on to to manipulate society in order to keep some people uh, wealthy and happy and healthy and safe and to keep others the opposite of those things. And so you all are in a really, really big position because land is everything. Land is opportunity, it's possibility, land is exclusionary, land is food justice, land is everything. And so as we think about how we can use these lands, and you know, we're here gathered under the umbrella of the land we share, um, but really it's the land that was involuntarily shared with us under the threat of force. And if we come to it with that humility and that understanding of this history, then I think it'll be so much easier for us to understand and, and move forward on some of this policy that some might consider radical. But I mean, what I think is radical is knowing, is you and me knowing that that bike is actually mine and us both choosing to live the lie that it's not. 
I am done talking as of now. Thank you for your time. Great, thank, thank you, Susanna, so much for uh, that presentation. We are, uh, we are tight on time. Um, Abby, I wonder if we maybe have just a couple minutes for questions, if anybody wants to ask or, or comments. Yes, thank you. So, hi everybody, I'm Abby White, Vice President for Strategic Communications. And we do have a time for a few questions. So if you'd like to ask one, please enter it in the Q&A, which scroll down to your control panel and, and type in a question. While you're all doing that, I'm also gonna put something into the chat. Uh, it's two things. One is an article that is about land theft. I was gonna talk about it today, but like I said, I can't manage the time, uh, but you can, and you're gonna take the time Time to read it because it's such a well-written article and I hope that it helps to um, be illustrative of the history of land use and land theft. And the second thing is an action and allyship guide that we put together at the state level uh, if you're looking to get more involved as an individual or if you'd like to see some suggested media for, for further learning. Awesome. Thank Susanna. Susanna. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I just There's want to Go ahead, Abby. Sorry. There's one question here that's in the chat and that it would be good to just get your thoughts on. So how can those of us who steward public lands make everybody feel more safe? Mm, yeah, that's huge. Um, so for starters, it means being very vocal and very visible against discrimination or bias or injustice. Right, because it's one thing to say, oh yeah, we know that somebody spray painted something really racist on a rock in the park, but that's not like us. Well, it's nice that you say that, but if I'm hiking by myself, which as a brown person, I would never do in this state, unfortunately, uh, but if I'm hiking by myself, it doesn't comfort me enough to know that that's not like you, right? I wanna know that I'm safe. And so some of the things that that might include, I mean, get, get creative, right? I'm thinking about college campuses, which now have those sort of call boxes uh, where you can call for, for help if you're being accosted on campus or something, or um, making really clear public declarations that we're not cool with this. If our rangers see it, they're going to do something about it. You might have criminal charges put against you if, there's some, if, if you're doing things you shouldn't be doing in the park. Um, this, might sound, this might sound radical, but um, I don't even want to say the words because it's so laced with criminal justice, but like have undercover people in the parks, just, you know, making sure that nobody's harassing other people because of immutable factors, you know, just have people in hiking clothes, chilling, who are just watching. I mean, I don't know, that seems a little big brotherish now that I say it out loud, but the point is, um, think about the things that would make you as a person feel safe and not feel safe, and maybe do those things. I know that if I am somewhere and I see um, a person in a police uniform, I don't feel safe. And I know a lot of people who are police whom I adore, but it is that initial shock when I see it that I'm just like, oh my God, am I going to survive the next seven minutes or not? And that's key. So put yourself in other people's shoes. What, what do you think would make you comfortable? What do you think would make them comfortable? And then do that. Thank you, Susanna. I think we have time just for one more quick one. So here's one from the Q&A says, there is a small fund named the Susu Collective in Brattleboro that is for BIPOC Vermonters to purchase land. Are there other similar opportunities elsewhere in our state? I think there are. Um, I've seen a number of informal funds that have been set up or lists where people's, you know, Venmo and other direct payment accounts have been shared. And, you know, there's a lot of value in that, I think, for people who, who find that empowering at the individual level. Um, I do think that Systemic problems require systemic solutions. And so to some extent, it's great to be able to put together a fund for people's individual land access and purchase. But what we really have to do is move the, is, is get to the bigger issue of why is land already so difficult for people of color and other marginalized people to access in the first place. Um, so I think, I mean, it's great if I can tap into a fund, but let's make it so that the fund doesn't have to exist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll have to leave it there, Susanna. Nick, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Yeah, I, you know, it's it's so such a great place to pause. I won't say end because we really are just getting started. I think in in this conversation of work, I, Susanna, thank you so much. You've I think laid out a really strong agenda for us to consider and to work on, uh, and. Um, I'm just so gratified to see the responses coming through in the chat um, to some of the ideas that you've shared with us and the call to action that you've made for us today. We're going we're gonna to pick it up. We are picking it up and we'll carry it forward. Um, so thank you so much for being with us today. It's been great. Thank you all for having me. Yeah. Um, we are going to turn now to awards. Um, this is an exciting moment for me to look back uh, over the course of the last year and to honor some of the folks who've made our great work happen. Um, and so I'm excited to jump in and do that with you all. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. The first award, um, which goes to, this is the Richard Carbon Community Award, which goes to the Mount Holly Conservation Trust. I know we have folks from the Mount Holly Conservation Trust on the line with us today um, participating in this annual celebration. Uh, a great project, uh, the Okemo Wildlife Corridor, which, you know, was uh, connecting uh, pieces of land that have been conserved and protected and part of the state parks and the national forest. Um, and we were able to uh, conserve uh, some critical pieces that allowed that corridor to become intact. And Mount Holly Group has just been an incredible uh, partner in that. And Joan, we you'll see the quote here from Joan Weir, who's uh, a longtime VLT staff person who retired this summer, and this project was um, a capstone, uh, one of many for her as she went out the door um, this summer. And Joan, I think I saw you on the list. We're really happy to have you with us here today. Um, so thank you so much. And each of the folks in the Mount Holly Conservation Trust, this board of directors group, will receive a copy of uh, a new book. Uh, well, I guess not, not quite so new anymore, but new this year, Wetlands, Woodlands, and Wildlands. Um, and one of the authors is our very own uh, Liz Thompson, and she's uh, autographed copies of that book for you all. So thank you so much uh, to the Mount Holly Conservation Trust. Uh, next slide, please. The Francisca King Thomas Award, which is given to somebody who's made a profound contribution to VLT. Um, and this year, I'm really excited to be giving this award. Uh, we we're excited to be giving this award to Teresa Thomas who's a program manager of water finance at the Vermont Department of Environmental Con Conservation. Teresa has done uh, incredible work over the last year uh, to allow us to create some access to the state's clean water revolving fund to fund our farmland futures work. And this is just a groundbreaking effort by Teresa uh, directing those clean water funds that are available at the state towards this green infrastructure of farmland. Um, we're really excited to be working with you, T. Um, and and this, this project and this work that you've done, we know is a national model that other folks are looking at. It's really exciting and great to be able to honor uh, you and this step that you took with us this year, all the great work together in, in achieving this. So very happy to be uh, presenting the Francesca King Thomas Award to you today. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this one, I may not get through without uh, shedding a tear or two, honestly. Um, Nancy Everhart is retiring uh, in a couple short weeks as the Agricultural Director at the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, which is our most important and closest partner. Um, and Nancy has been the Ag Director at VHCB for nearly two decades now, which means that she's worked with us on probably 500 farmland conservation projects across the state. There's not a piece of Vermont that hasn't been touched by her work. She's been with us every step of the way um, and we're grateful for that contribution, um, the partnership that we've had with you, Nancy. Uh, and we wish you all the best and we're gonna, we're gonna miss the heck out of you. Um, and um, it's, your, your uh, contribution to the state is just incredible and tremendous. And, it's a real pleasure and an honor um, to, to give you the John Bailey Dunn Award, um, honoring your lifelong contribution to, to conservation work. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, next slide. Um, we're very excited this year. Uh, last year was the, was the first time we were able to give an award in honor of Eric Rosendahl, who's, um, who was a farmer who passed away a couple of years ago um, 
uh, at an early age, um, but had already established himself as a real force in the um, in the Vermont food system and in our movement, an incredible farmer, um, an incredible champion for social justice, and uh, and a really amazing entrepreneur and um, and a good friend. Uh, we're, we're sad to see Eric pass. His family worked with us to create a, an award in his memory and an honor. Um, and last year, we were able to give that award for the first time. Um, this year, the committee met and they had such a good set of um, applications and such strong candidates for the award to recognize an a entrepreneurial farmer in this state um, that they, they came up with too. And we figured out a way working with uh, Jan Rosendahl and his family and their friends to uh, make the award to two farms this year. So both Tom Gilbert at Black Dirt Farm and Amanda Andrews at Tamarack Hollow Farm are going to be receiving a $5,000 award in honor of Eric and in his memory. And we know they're gonna do great things with those awards and with that funds, uh, with those funds to invest in the future of farming here in Vermont. Um, we love your work. We're glad to support you and, and all the farms um, that we work with here um, who are helping to make this just a, a wonderful place to live now and going forward. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll take the next, next slide, please. So we're coming close to the end of our meeting here. I just wanted to um, put up, we wanted to put up this slide and share with you that the conversation doesn't stop on a bunch of different topics. Um, we will continue to be reaching out and having virtual events throughout the course of the fall. Um, and we really hope that you'll join us. A lot of you have, um, and we've seen it as a great opportunity to connect with members um, and to share some of the, just the examples of the many different projects and the work that we've been, been um, engaged with over the last year. Um, it's really, it's, it's, it's expanding, it's proliferating. Um, and you're helping to make that happen. It's really, it's really wonderful. I hope you'll continue to join us at those um, events. And um, you can just also sign up and stay on our newsletter, our email list. It's a great way to know what's happening and to keep touch with us throughout the course of the year. Um, yeah, it's really, it was, it's an um, amazing thing to get to spend this time with you, even in this strange way. Um, and lovely to have this chance to engage. Mark, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Do you have any thoughts to take us um, out into the world as we, as we end our annual celebration this year? Well, <clears throat> thank you everyone. This is, uh, thanks for spending an hour with us uh, all together. And this concludes our first digital membership meeting. Uh, please join me in thanking Susanna for such a dense and interesting, valuable, thoughtful presentation. Susanna, thank you. And recognizing all our award recipients as the board and the entire organization. It is 5.30, one hour exactly, and we conclude this meeting and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see ya. Bye-bye.